My philosophy for the entire film is super fly. Everything is super fly. The lighting, the camera, the clothing, the sets, the cars, the guns, the, the actors. Everything you see is a little flyer than normal. I want people to be in the movie asking where'd they get that? That's so cool. Look at that thing. You're just, you're just, it's a wave of cool shit flying at you constantly. Priest is extremely focused. He is a bit restless. He wants new challenges. He wants new things. He's always ready for to go another way. But at the same time, he has a luck about him. Um, professionally, romantically, people like him. People want to help him. And these, it's a fortunate combination. He, he's just one of these people. Priest is. There's people in the world that just shine brighter. There's people in the world that can, can, who get more, and since they get more, they're required to do more, and that's Priest. Eddie's more random. Eddie's unpredictable. Eddie is change, constantly change. You can't, you can't say this is where he's going to be. He's, where Priest is stable, Eddie's moving, moving. He's another lucky guy. He's another guy that just has that luck on him. That's why they're friends. Um, but, but not quite in the way Priest is, right? Uh, you know, we all see rappers now, and if, if you really follow a rapper closely, not only do you know who the rapper is, you know who his right-hand man is. A couple of them. You, you, you see who their friends are around them, and that's Eddie. Eddie's that right-hand man, where Priest is the superstar rapper that fills stadiums. Eddie's the guy who's always with him, who makes sure he's all right. In 1971, Harlem was the epicenter of black culture. It was what the whole world heard and thought of. The clubs in Harlem were famous worldwide. The drug dealers in Harlem were famous worldwide. It was really what Atlanta is today. If you're an artist in Atlanta and you got a hit record, you got a hit record around the world. You know what I mean? So when we're telling this story for today and we're placing it in the epicenter of black culture, there is no question that it has to be Atlanta. What Alex and I shaped together was an outline that then became the foundation for the script. And like I said, that was us talking about, all right, what is it now? Where in the original, he gets attacked by junkies, and we took that to mean he gets attacked by people in the game. It's not just an attack randomly. It's you know people that are part of the drug world. But the superfly today isn't running around in places where junkies can attack him. So we said, all right, well, what if they're rival drug dealers? Okay, great. In the original, the police come and, and uh, these dirty cops are also his supplier. Well, it's hard to believe the amount of money we want now to make that this could come just from the cops, which then got us into cartels. Um, but we still, you know, so there's an expansion of the story for our understanding of the drug culture of today. But at the same time, you can see it's rooted in the original film and the original story. Snow Patrol is symbolic of flashy drug dealers. Uh, that they're, you know, they got a very loose cover that no one believes. <laughs> it's, uh, we make music, and, you know, something like that. So it's just something really simple. But that's what it symbolizes, the, the guys that will go and buy the flashy car and get on Instagram and be on a yacht or just with no explanation of how they could do this and then ultimately get taken down because of the stupidity. Um, so that's, that's it. When Alex first wrote the script and we were saying, yeah, they got these drug dealers and he came with the name. He said, yeah, they're Snow Patrol and they wear all white. And I go, yes, that's perfect. And, it informed the movie. Once we said the bad guys all wear white, drive white cars, have all white businesses, have white guns, it said the movies were, 
we're not making a grimy, gritty, realistic, handheld drug story that you wonder is a documentary. We're making a movie. Staying true to the source material, Georgia was, let's leave right now. I don't need anything. I don't need a lot. We can just go. I only want to be with you. And Cynthia was, what the hell you mean, leave? <laughs> leave? This is what you do. You can't leave. This is, this is the life you live. You're crazy. So we brought those two perspectives. Uh, they're yin and yang. They, they have valid points, but they're always opposite. So you get both sides of the argument from these two. And all together, you can see how these two girls and priest make uh, one unit. What I wanted for the music, when I looked at the original and said, what made this soundtrack something? It was that Curtis Mayfield took it and had a vision for the music singularly. He had a vision for himself. And that's what I wanted. I wanted to hand the music to someone who would have a vision that would understand the world, could make a commentary on it. And really, there's only one person when you start talking about these requirements and its future. It could be no one else. We live in the age of the hip-hop artists. 50 Cent, Jay-Z, Gucci Man, T.I., I mean, Migos. <laughs> so many of these artists, Rick Ross. <laughs> uh, so many of these artists have lived this life. And, and not a, you know, yeah, there's some people faking, but there's a good amount of people who really live this life. And wanted to, you know, they wanted that dream. They, they, they came from circumstances where they didn't feel they had a lot of options. So they went this way. They wanted, they wanted to live the American dream. But once they got a chance to let that be their past, they put that in their past. So this is the music we hear all the time. We hear these references, we hear this world. We know the average person knows way too much about drug dealing than they should <laughs> through uh, hip hop music. And for this story to be right now, this is very relevant to the culture.